Hello and welcome to all of you to this webinar organized by Kashmir Institute of International Relations in collaboration with World Muslim Congress as a sideline event on the sidelines of 50th session of United Nations Human Rights Council. Uh, today we will be discussing about the unlawful prevention, uh, unlawful activity prevention act, uh, which is a hanging sword on human rights defenders and journalists in not quite Kashmir, not only these, but also to all people, uh, be that uh, social media users, government employees, or other activists in not quite Kashmir. Uh, though this uh, Unlawful Prevention Activities Act uh, 1967 was uh, amended in on July 4th, 2019 uh, by the government of India, and thereafter, this act has been used against the civil rights activists in the whole of India, but especially in Indian occupied Kashmir. We all know this act, uh, which was the Mendes Gill's government of India, may designate any organization as terrorist organization. And with this amendment, Additionally, it empowers the government to designate individuals as terrorists on the same grounds that is uh, that permit or participate in an act of terrorism, prepare for terrorism, promote terrorism, as the otherwise involved in terrorism. So under this act, NIA, uh, that's National Investigation Agency of uh, India, that has uh, the role to investigate this and they have the powers even to uh, annex their properties. And we have seen that uh, under this act, uh, thousands of people in New York by Kashmir were arrested. And in, during, uh, from 2019 to 2021, 60% uh, of the arrests made in India, the cases were registered against the people in New York by Kashmir, mainly journalists, uh, active social media activists, and human rights defenders. We also know the political leadership who is in Tihar jail, they are facing the charges under the SAM Act. And recently we have seen one conviction against the uh, prominent political leader, Mohammed Yasin Malik. And we have seen uh, also the Purum Parvez, the prominent human rights defender and uh, worldly acknowledged human rights defender also facing the SAM charges here. The Indian government slapping these individuals with these provisions of UAP has become a survival in unoccupied Jammu and Kashmir. Even those who show solidarity with the people of Palestine or show solidarity or uh, just uh, uh, celebrate the game of cricket of Pakistan, they are being slapped with the same act in unoccupied Jammu and Kashmir. So we will be discussing this as uh, we have a very learned panel. Uh, Advocate Nasir Qadri, who is the executive director of uh, the legal firm for victims of Kashmir, he has recently uh, issued a biannual report on the human rights violation in occupied Jammu and Kashmir. Especially, uh, he has documented the cases under UAPA and other uh, draconian laws, as we know that, uh, like Armed Forces Special Power Act, Public Safety Act and other acts which remain in, in, in occupied Kashmir, uh, they have always been used against uh, the political leaders, civil society actors, and human rights defenders there. So I will first uh, go to Advocate Nasir Qadri for his presentation as he has documented an extensive report on this and has a legal background also, has been monitoring all these cases. Advocate Nasir Qadri, uh, you have the Uh, thank you, Mr. Wani Saab. Uh, thank you, WNC and KIR team for inviting me in this conference. Yes. This is the third time I'm speaking. Nazir Saab, ek to camera ki taraf aa jaye. Camera aapke aap pure nahi aa rahe hain. Aur dusri awaz aapke bhi nahi aa rahi hai. Uh, on the same uh, the UAPA Act. 
since 2019 we have seen टेरिटरी I have uh, written so so much on the uh, UAPA or Public Safety Act, and then there, of course, we have documented so many cases, and uh, the methods which uh, the state authorities, or to be specific, the occupying authorities, employ while they frame charges under UAPA. And uh, as Vani Sab uh, said recently, our report it has already given a contradiction. Uh, what MHA has stated uh, in the floor before the floor of parliament and then the virgin and the data revealed from the state uh, police the mha says that since 2019 they have detained 750 kashmiris under this draconian law but uh, the state police their official data says they themselves says that they have detained 2300 kashmiris which include the journalists which include the human rights defenders students professors teachers under this draconian law so all now this so your internet is not working perhaps yeah. uh, i have said that i have we have uh, certain Uh, so much i have uh, given a presentation on this crisis can you hear me one is clear yeah yeah okay thank you so uh, today i want to just add few things uh, while we present the 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 case of uapa which is uh, randomly used again as the human rights defenders and particularly again as the journalists to muzzle their voices Nazir Zab, you are gone offline. Basically, yeah, this uh, UAP is basically a tactics of the. One is up. Can 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 uh, can I wait for some time? Because my internet is struggling. I don't know. Okay, let us start with Rihanna. Uh, let me go to Rihanna, and then we will go to you. you... please correct your internet and setting please okay um thank you for actually inviting me me today and especially thank you ki k r k i r k i a r and i would like to actually um uh, like say, say say thanks to the other organization who's working with uwmc um this uh, before i start i would just give a little ad- advice to nasir kadri that sometime uh, what you can do is if you uh, take your camera away and just talk Uh, that does help you as well so we can't see your picture but we can hear you properly um going back to my uh, uh, like the reports that i have actually done is uh, unlawful activities provision act 1967 this was the time when it was introduced it was updated in 2019 and it was uh, an amendment was made on the 8th of august uh, 2019 this is after india took over um o- occupy uh, occupied kashmir individually could be charged for indiv- uh, unlawful um activities especially terrorism activities after 
uh, after this date. So be, before this date, uh, you could only be charged if you were a part of a organization, but they actually made this, uh, they actually did implement in the law very quickly because they actually knew that things are going to not going to be the same in Kashmir. So they can start arresting individuals. Uh, this act replaced a POTA, which is called Prevention of, uh, Pre Prevention of um, Terrorism Audience Act 2001. And uh, th this was actually um, enacted from 2002 to 2004. And then TADA, which is actually a terrorist, uh, terrorist and, uh, and <laughs> disruptive activities a provision act. And this was uh, imposed between, uh, enacted between 1985 to 1995. Now these two laws uh, were actually taken away. They were abolished because there was a lot of complaints on it. Uh, on the international uh, level, and even the Indians were complaining that these laws were were, were not only like uh, illegal; uh, they were actually like um, against the, the international law of human rights. So what they did is cleverly that they take the, took these laws away, and then they actually may, uh, implemented the actually new law, which is a law collective supervision act. So I would call this law the baby of these two. So people are still in prison today who are who have been charged under these two laws, and they're actually waiting to be heard. And the world needs to know that so they can be actually heard. And and these laws are actually in very laws. And I'm going to go uh, go uh, ahead and come uh, and um, let you know. Yupa was supported by the um, government national uh, democratic uh, line. So basically they actually wanted some kind of law in the country so they can actually control, keep a control on the citizen. Now, what I feel is with all these laws like um, anti-terrorism laws in India, especially detention laws, it only gives one indication that for India, every single Indian is a terrorist because there's so many detention laws in India, which only confirms that there's no freedom of, of expression and is violating the international freedom of expression. Yupa was um, sport, um, less, okay, now once you are charged with, with Yupa, you have very rare chances that you can have a bill. And what happened is normally that you are being put in away for six months, and in the six months, there's no trial, and then there's no bill. Now, uh, now section 13 of Yupa, however, uh, takes um, a, a, whoever gets actually um, uh, done under the section 13. This is actually, um, in simple words, I would say that anybody who advocates, advises, or takes part in any unlawful activity which can harm the integrity of India or the laws over there, although um, Kashmiris don't fall into the category of being citizens, they actually can be arrested under this law and is actually a draconian law. And the punishment which can be given, it actually starts from uh, six months is going to be detention. And after that, the punishment which can be normally given is between five, five to seven years. And uh, there's also one more punishment like a, like a fine. So they can actually apply a fine to it as, as well. Okay, section 13, uh, subsection three, trying to attempt from... Um, uh, from uh, now, what they have done is cleverly. Now, this point should be noted that under Section 13.3, they are saying that no treaty convention can can actually interfere in whatever they, they do because India has signed uh, treaties, as we know, Geneva Convention and some other human rights treaties on the international level. So, under this uh, section, uh, Section 13.3, they are trying to say that like there can be no interference from any government uh, treaty or. or or any kind of convention. So this needs to be taken into account and we need to highlight this, that this is not possible because Kashmir comes under the um, uh, Geneva Convention. So Geneva Convention means that the people in Kashmir are called uh, protected persons. So they have to be respected and their rights have to be respected at all times. Now this, um, this act is controlled uh, by the central government. So the central government, government took over after the 5th of August when, when uh, Kashmir was taken over by, by India and the highest punishment uh, can be given under this law is actually life imprisonment or it can be death sentence. Now point to be noted, a bench of uh, justice, uh, Siddharth and uh, Anopam uh, uh, said this a while ago that the word terrorism has nowhere been defined in UPA. So beforehand they didn't have any word called terrorists defined in this law, but they kept on using it for the, uh, for the terrorism activities, which is a violation of this law as well, and it's a violation of Indian uh, constitution and international laws. But in 2004, they actually did, uh, did the amendment and they added in the world uh, terrorism over there, 
to, to actually cover their crimes and to continue uh, with, their, with their own uh, like crimes. Now, terror funding. So what, what we hear is that many of our leaders who have been detained under this law uh, before 2004 were even said that they, they were taken because of terror funding. Now, if, if the word terror was not uh, actually in the law at that time, how can they be detained for terror funding? So this is a point as well, uh, which actually needs, needs to be um, uh, like um, highlighted uh, under my um, research. Okay, moving on, I would say that uh, UPA is a mockery of Article 14 and Article 15 and Article 19, especially Article 22 of Indian Constitution. Now, what is Article 14? Article 14 is that under the law, everybody is equally, like, like they have equal rights under the law. Article 25 means it doesn't uh, mean that if you're from a different gender, from a different caste, from a different religion, but you're going to be given equal rights under the state of India. And Article 19, Article 19, everybody know, is about freedom of expression. Now, this law is actually not letting people say what, what they have to say because it's taken away the, the voice. And even if you are having a peaceful protest, even if you are actually saying something is wrong uh, from the government, they are still actually uh, slapping you, which actually you are. Now, what is Article 22. Now, Article 22 is very, very important. Article 22 means that if anybody is detained or, or, or if any anybody is actually arrested, they will be informed, they will be given a chance to actually represent themselves, or they can hire a solicitor like a lawyer of their own choice. Now, what India is doing that under this draconian law and Public Safety Act, it is not giving you the right to know why you have been detained. You are not being told how long you're going to be kept. Or, or, or like what you have done or what is going to be done to you, but the family members can get in touch. So this is violating India's own um, like um, art, uh, uh, constitution, Article 22. Now, Article 22, part, uh, subsection four, which is actually per, per prevention of detention, and then subsection seven, which actually um, deals with the length and the procedure of the, of the detention with the advisory committee. And it also gives the right to the parliament to actually enact laws. This was revoked. And when this was revoked, on the after the 44 amendment act 1978 now not only this was revoked now what mean is that any law which was before that time uh, becomes invalid so before that time there were two laws which were which were enacting uh, one was public safety act and one was a lawful equity provision act so these laws have become totally uh, invalid and any future laws with detention are going to be invalid as well in that way that you can't uh, can't arrest or detain somebody um, like uh, like beforehand and you can't actually um, uh, uh, like exercise the, the punishments for them because this was taken out of the um, of Indian constitution. Now, many people actually don't know this, and this is very, very important that we need to know that these laws are not only invalid now, they are illegal as, as well. New, um, okay, uh, okay. Now, now the other thing, uh, thing I would like to say is that that, um, that uh, crimes now, if India is using these uh, laws, it, it is not only doing war crimes; it also doing crimes against against uh, 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 crimes against humanity and and uh, 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 ca carried out in Kashmir and in other parts of India. Now, India is not only using these laws. For Kashmiris, as we know that these laws have been used in India as well, especially for actually Sikhs and for Christians in like Manipur, Nagaland, and in other areas as well. Now, this law is becoming so dangerous that it's been spread all over India. So it's about time that we need to highlight it and let the world know about it. Okay, next point is going to be a terrorist punishment for their activities were added to UPA in 2004. As I said, that in 2004, the word terrorism was actually um, uh, added on so, so they can cover up themselves uh, under chapter five. Now, more amendments were actually made in 2008, 2013, and finally in, in 2019, after, after Kashmir was taken over, um, as I said earlier, on the 8th of uh, August. A definition um, and, and basically detention is for six months, as I said earlier, and you can't have a trial or a bail. It's very, very hard to actually apply for a, for, for a bail or a trial once you're done, but your family members can try. Detention laws can turn innocence into criminal by keeping them imprisonment without being guilty. So, so they have been keeping a lot of uh, Kashmiri uh, youngsters, like a young school, uh, school college, uh, like youth, 
Uh, they've been taking on like housewives as well. Anybody who is raising their voice, even in a peaceful manner, is actually being detained under uh, under this law. If you remember, uh, Mushtaq Ahmed Bhatt, uh, he was at uh, he was detained as well because he was asking uh, for his son's body because his son was actually um, uh, like killed, uh, as we know, uh, along with some other, other boys. And there are many other uh, things happened in Kashmir, as we know that say Delhi Jalani's uh, children and then also specialized children were actually detained as well on the time uh, when when they were they were getting buried uh, because they at least had some anti uh, anti uh, Indian slogans at that time. Um, so we need to keep these things in mind and they need to be high highlighted. Uh, detention um, that data from NCRB uh, and NCRB first. And in earlier 2019, st states that 1,948 arrests were done and and de detained uh, and detaining in individuals, but not led to any any hearing or trial. So basically, 1,948 people were arrested, and still they are actually waiting for their uh, trials and hearings uh, since 2019. So we need to highlight that there are many people still waiting, not only from uh, because they have been detained under uh, UPA, they have been actually de detained under quota and, and from data, they're still behind prisons and they need to be highlighted and the world needs to know ab about that. Watchdog, Amnesty International said, UPA facilitates the, uh, the, government, uh, the government's human rights abuses as and is as and is an evidence of the abuse of power. So, so once again, we hear that Amnesty International, uh, which always speaks up uh, for the human rights, saying that UPA facilitates the government's uh, violation of human rights abuses, and it's evidence that um, of power. So, India is trying to show its force and power by doing this. Since 2019, about 2005. Hundred about 2,500 Kashmiris have been detained, and this is uh, the information uh, given by Al Jazeera. Half widows and half orphans were actually invented by Public Safety Act and UPA, uh, UPA, which are invalid and illegal laws. As I said earlier, that after the 44 Amendment Act 1978 was actually passed, all the laws before that time became invalid and they're illegal now. We hear that Kurur Parvez. Um, Asan onto uh, Sultan um, uh, Asif Sultan Yasin Malik, Masara Talambat, and Masara Zah uh, and Masara Zahra. They have been detained. Uh, Masara Zahra, I think she's not uh, like in detention anymore. But all the other ones are still behind, uh, still behind prison. And a uh, journalist Asif Sultan has been actually uh, in, in prison since 2018, and it's an ongoing thing. And many more people are in prison, which names I'm not taking on. But these people have been in prison for a long time, and they have been. Um, uh, they have been cases thrown on them, which are actually wrong, wrong cases. Any non-violence, uh, uh, any non-violence non voice for oppression against the atrocities of freedom slogans are considered anti-national and a form of terrorism, which is against the uh, in, international, uh, which is uh, uh, which is against the international freedom of, of, of expression, especially um, especially United Nations Declaration of Human Rights, Article Four. Um, um, uh, uh, United Nations Security Council Resolution 47. Now, what does this Resolution 47 say? It says, kill plebiscide, no political uh, uh, prisoner is legal, and Kashmiris being protected person under Geneva Convention cannot be uh, political prisoners. So this is something that we need to note, that what India is doing is going against uh, not only its own constitution, it's going against international standards, and especially a Geneva Convention. Um, because uh, Kashmir is a disputed state listed with the United Nations since 1948 and 18 uh, security, Council, uh, security Council resolutions have been passed to actually make Kashmir a disputed area and is on the list of the United Nations. United Nations and Amnesty International say UPA does not meet the international standards. So India cannot be considered a democracy. The definition of the terror, uh, of the terror act is very broad and, and, and detention is very lengthy, says United Nations. Also, it says that bills are not being given. So this is below the, the, the international standards of human rights. So I'm, I'm going to be moving on just a few more lines. Social media. Now, what has been happening? People who are civilians who are using social media, they have been booked as well. And the only way left 
that they can actually use internet and they feel safest by using a VPN. Now, there has been many cases that even uh, Kashmiri youth have been uh, arrested from their houses, uh, detained from their houses, uh, although they have been using UPN and they've been taken to the local police station where they have been asked to sign a bond. It's like a contract that they are not going to say anything on social media, which is against the interest of India and the world should not know what is happening. And this is the only way some of them allowed to come back home, but then they have been keeping a close eye that they don't do anything and they don't let anybody know about uh, 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 about the bond, uh, like a contract to the bond taking place. As I said earlier, the family members of say the Ghilani and Al Sarai and cricket lover children have been detained for raising the uh, raising the, the slogans, the Kashmiri slogans. Uh, the last thing I would I would say is that like uh, this law is one of the most um, draconian laws I've ever heard in the world. And, and it has to be highlighted along with other draconian laws, which is Public uh, Safety Act. And there's one, one more law, which is called uh, National uh, Security Act, which was enacted in 1980. So all these laws come under the same category, but that law is not much used on Kashmiris at the moment, apart from these two. And we have Avsapa, which is the mother of all evils, I will say, uh, which has been in Kashmir since 1990, and it's made the life hell of every single Kashmiri. Till that law is in, in, in Kashmir, there can never be peace. And only on suspicion, anybody can be arrested, killed, uh, killed, raped. Houses can be arsoned, like burnt, detained, and any place they, they can be stopped and, and, and actually searched. So this law is actually called a license to kill and rape law. We need to highlight about these laws as well. And thank you and, and uh, for actually giving me the opportunity to actually talk about this law. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Advocate Rihanna Ali. Advocate Rihanna Ali is uh, the second uh, information secretary of Tariq Hudiyat UK and also hosts a show live with Rihanna at uh, UK. She's a very uh, strong voice of Kashmir in the UK. Uh, thank, thank you, brother. Dan uh, thank you, brother. This is one, one thing I'd like to add is Tariq Kashmir, uh, by mistake, usually said Hudiyat. Thank you, so so Ziana, she was uh, telling us about the historical perspective of this law and how is it is being used in Indian occupied Kashmir and India and how it violates the right to life and other provisions of not only the Indian constitution but also the international law and international humanitarian law. Uh, so I think Nasir Kadri is back. Uh, we will now listen to Nasir Qadri, sir. Uh, sorry, sorry, my internet was not stable. I'm extremely sorry. No. Okay. Uh, am I am I audible now? Yes, you are. Thank you. Okay, fine, fine. So what I was telling about the UAPA, uh, the, a lot has been written uh, about the UAPA. And then you, you have seen the earlier presentation, how the UAPA or any other uh, draconian law violates the international standards, international laws, uh, be it uh, the ICCPR, UDHR, or for that matter, the Geneva Conventions. <clears throat> but let me be really specific on these laws. To me now, these laws, uh, it has a, I see a difference using the laws in uh, Kashmir or in mainland, man, mainland India, sorry. So in Kashmir, you know, we are in a state of a war. There is a war-like situation. So uh, using UAPA, it is for everything, for everyone. The UAPA is being used for activists, for journalists, for students, for cricket players, for journalists. So this UAPA, so why this UAPA? It is basically a new tactics of the counterinsurgency. So there are so many forms, means and methods of, of counterinsurgency. I see it one of the main method to curb, to stifle the free speech. And then coming uh, to the this uh, the critical critically evalu evaluating if we critically evaluate this law, uh, in my previous presentation, uh, I, I think Vanisa would remember that I told that this is basically India is doing a paper uh, work warfare in uh, Kashmir, the weaponizing laws, weaponizing legal system. 
to ensure the prolonged occupation, to ensure the indefinite incarceration of uh, activists or uh, Kashmiris. If we see that uh, the, uh, the legality or the constitutionality of the U this UAPA, not only uh, high courts uh, in uh, JNK, but Supreme Court also challenged the validity. I have seen so many lawyers. I uh, some before some days I was just hearing the webinar of uh, the C one of the senior uh, criminal lawyer of India. Uh, her name is Rebecca Mamon John. She said that uh, we we Modi's India is is it, it, it's a kind of a disaster. She were talking about the UAPA that it should be removed before India would be in a big trouble. It, these laws should be removed from the statutes. And uh, you see that the now, uh, the, in addition, how uh, these uh, laws is, uh, are prevalent in the IOJK. You, you have seen there are so many, we have uh, reported so many incidents or, or so many, uh, the, the organize, how, they, how they use the law to ban the organizations. And then there are so many cases to terminate uh, the employees uh, from their services by invoking these anti-terrorism laws and then uh, declaring someone a terrorist. You know, there's one important element. If you have to declare someone a terrorist, there should be a definition of a terrorist, terrorism. You know how they define this terrorism or terrorist organization? It's their own subject to satisfaction. There's no, there's no definition. What kind of terrorism what constitutes the terrorist organization? They use it as their own for the for their own subject to sex. They can just book anyone for anything in IOJK. They can declare any property as unlawful for the unlawful activities and attach it. And now every the, the human rights defenders, the, the one of the best case for the this is Khurum Parvez case. You see the sections in work in the Khurams. Kurum is a reputed human rights defender. And then the section that invokes are that he is associate of the terrorist organization, JKCCS. He was documenting the war crimes in the occupied Kashmir. How is it, how would you justify documenting a human rights as a terrorist organization? So you see, to me, uh, this, uh, the laws, be it a public safety act, a detention without a trial, or the uh, UAPA in the occupied Kashmir, or for that matter, the APSPA, which is uh, which gives the absolute imp uh, impunity to a soldier to kill or uh, to destroy whatever comes in his way. He used his own will. So basically, these are just a means to suppress the ongoing war of liberation movement. And uh, I'll not take you much time because uh, I already told you, we have written a lot of, uh, I mean, uh, critical, we have critically evaluated this law. There are so many things you can just see a report, how we have just cited the difference, the contradiction now, it, 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 it's a kind of a frustration. The MHA in 2022, before the floor of parliament said that they have detained only 700, some uh, seven, more than 700 Kashmiris under UAPA. But at the same time, the state police, which invoke this law, the Jammu and Kashmir police, their data reveals that they have detained 2,300 uh, Kashmiris under this UAPA. So there's a clear contradiction, a rampant use of these laws and nobody is there to ask them. So to me, uh, the remedy which I see as a student of law, we have to just, uh, you have to see that because whatever India is doing is, is, is uh, to me is a cr war crime, crime against humanity. And uh, we have to identify all these, we have to, uh, we have to work on uh, documenting these cases and let us not forget the perpetrators. This is the time that we can build, we can work on these, uh, I mean, uh, whosoever is the uh, the criminal, because if you if you if you infringe the right of fair trial, that also amounts uh, to a war crime. It is uh, say Article Eight of the uh, ICC statute or, or the Rome statute. 
So this, what is this Public Safety Act? This is basically a detention without a trial. They don't give you a right to trial. And then deten Then once uh, there's a case, there are so many cases, you detain journalists, then they are released by the court, like Fahad Shah, and then they don't comply these court orders. They detain journalists under the Public Safety Act. Yesterday, I heard that Asanantu, again, he is a human rights defender. He was uh, the court, the additional court of this uh, Tada and Porta, they directed his release. And then immediately they have, he has been booked under this Public Safety Act. So the, 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 the acts which these occupying authorities, that they're doing, it's, it's, a, it's a ballot and violation of the humanitarian law. It's a ballot and violation of the, the international humanitarian the law of war, or for that matter, the, the uh, international human rights law. If we see the ICCPR or UDHR, see there are, there are so many uh, articles we say that you cannot deny someone of his fair trial, but uh, there is a, a brazen violation, a broad day violation of these laws. In this chaos and the, a kind of a frustration, what do we can do? You know, uh, of course, this this is a very complex conflict, but uh, let us not forget documenting these crimes, documenting. I mean, naming and shaming these perpetrators, who whosoever he is the police officers, the, uh, the incumbent government, the previous governments. Let us not have a soft corner on those like the, the Mahbubah Mufti, Umar Abdullah, who were the main engineers of the, the, these, uh, I mean, uh, his father, his, great, uh, his grandfather. Because he, they're all, uh, I mean, uh, the, the criminals who introduced these laws, and then used for the civilian, against the civilians, against those activists who are demanding the right to self-determination guaranteed by the uh, multiple of UNSC resolutions. Uh, this is what I have to say. Thank you very much. And I'm sorry for the my poor uh, connection. Thank you, Vani Saab. Uh, thank you, Advocate Nasir Qadi. You apprised us about uh, the, how these laws being used in Kashmir amply, and how the civil society, human rights defenders, and journalists, and overall the population in occupied Kashmir, with the government implies, are the victims of this law. And not only the men, uh, but also women of Kashmir are facing the same law. And this has been used. This is being used by the Indian government now. Previously, it was Public Safety Act, a revolving door uh, policy. Now, the UAPA is like this. According to the NCRP report, uh, which to be this 95 cases of UAPA trials, 85% of uh, investigations are pending. And it indicates that how the judicial process uh, and uh, the detainees and accused must endure uh, during this long judicial process. And uh, El Dali lawyer, Zabine Shaker, who told the Article 14, who documented the cases, tried to document uh, and about the stories of UAPA invoked in Kashmir. But uh, among the two, uh, two, 2,300 victims of Kashmir, only three came to testify because others uh, awaited the witness before this tribunal because uh, they, fe and they uh, feared that reprisals on the part of the government. Uh, Abhinav Abhin said that uh, this law is harsh law in many accounts, lesser procedural rights, bail regime and crime definition are super boarded and that allows probe agencies to see overtly innocent conduct as a terror act by merely alleging the conduct was accompanied by some criminal intent. So by these uh, ways they are framing the people in Kashmir. And we have seen uh, some of the great human rights defenders in India who, who would use their voice uh, for the people of Kashmir. They're also language behind the bars. Uh, uh, minority human rights defenders, he died uh, during the incarceration in the Indian jails. Uh, so now I will go straight away to Ovas Bin Fasi, 
who has been Basi is the acting dean of social sciences at Trefa University. Uh, Dr. Basi, you have the floor. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Vani Saab, for uh, uh, inviting me, for uh, giving me this chance to share my thoughts and observations on this very important subject. Though my predecessor, Leonard Speakers, they have quite extensively, quite comprehensively covered the technical or legality of this uh, uh, UAPA implications and also suggested that we need to codify, we need to document these laws. Uh, I'll divide my talk or brief uh, you know, sharing of my thoughts into two parts. The first one is generally I will talk about these laws this law and the second one is I will talk about with specific reference to JNK. It's uh, paradoxical that uh, and highly ironical that India wants to project itself at the world stage as the largest democracy with multiple ethnicities and religious diversities, but it, its, its claims do not commensurate with the facts on ground. Those facts which are on the ground, those realities which are on the ground, they are contrary to what India professes. It's not, not just UAPA, there is a systemic litany of events which substantiate this claim, making Indian democracy a stain, a bloat, and blow on the very system, a very system and very concept of democracy. So, but since uh, we are limited to this law, so we'll restrict our, you know, points to this UAPA, which this law is contrary, has already been discussed, but th that reiteration, that reputation uh, is, uh, I think, necessary, that it's contrary to the basic frame of Indian constitution, key provisions of the constitution, particularly pertaining to fundamental freedoms and civil liberties, international norms and practices of human rights, universally, those practices and norms uh, they are universally accepted, acknowledged, and codified in human rights statutes and owned by human rights organizations. So this law, uh, when it was first introduced during Indira Gandhi's era, though it was not as lethal as it is now, but BJP's parent party at that time, Jana Sang, opposed it, uh, that uh, it's a political tool, and it would be used against the uh, opposition for political mileage. But now BJP has brought such amendments to this law as uh, has rightly been pointed out that it's a baby of Kota and Tata. So calling it a law, I think is a mockery, mockery of law. And it is a, a continuation of the uh, unfortunate tradition of black laws enacted in India for several decades. So this law is in fact a unique in legal history in which uh, accused are put behind bars without giving his right to trial and right to bail. And it violated accepted norms of uh, all international law and all criminal uh, procedure. India also uh, wants to project internationally while clubbing it, while clubbing this uh, UAPA with different resolutions uh, adopted, for example, 1373 adopted in 2001, then 1267 adopted in 1999, 1333-2000, 1363-201. So there are a lot of uh, uh, resolutions adopted internationally uh, uh, in, uh, for counterterrorism. So India, in fact, wants to relate it, wants to club it, wants to associate it with that uh, uh, counterterrorism um, efforts internationally. But as a matter of fact, what is the reality? It has nothing to do with terrorism. Rather, it might fan further terrorism. Students, journalists, lawyers, peaceful protesters, they are framed as terrorists. How could this innocuous professionals, the names I have taken, be a threat to the sovereignty and integrity of a country which at the, at the world stage, you know, touts and claims as a country with, with military muscles? So according to a report, that was also quoted by MP, uh, in, in, uh, Indian MP, that 66% cases out of 66% uh, uh, accused are not involved 
in 66% case, cases in any kind of violence, let alone terrorism. Uh, there are several cases, uh, some of the cases uh, discussed here, uh, booked under uh, UAPA, but some cases which are very, I think, uh, uh, need to be quoted here, that an 84-year Christian father who got arrested under U UAPA, but died in custody. And human rights organizations at international uh, uh, level, they have also expressed their deploration, condemnation, uh, grief, remorse, and concern uh, of, this, uh, of this death. So how can an octogenarian, senile person could be a threat to, to one of the largest democracy? This is a big question mark. Uh, to this uh, uh, this democracy and the claim that it it makes. Similarly, there is another uh, case that a newly married Muslim businessman who was just picked up and remained in jail for nine months without any trial, but later on he stood vindicated. So uh, all these charges they proved fallacious. So there are a lot of cases. Uh, people are uh, languishing in jail for ten to twelve years. There is a uh, one case in which it was. Uh, uh, they, they, they had to languish in jails. So uh, uh, in, in JNK, uh, 10 students, they were picked up and booked under UAPA saying that they were playing cricket in memory of a killed uh, uh, militant. So uh, I think that uh, if we see the cases uh, booked under UAPA, so it uh, uh, questions its intent, its purpose, its goal and objective. So before I come to, uh, to, to, the, to the other segment of uh, uh, my talk, I just uh, wrap up this part by quoting an excerpt of a recent speech of Ambassador Richard Mills, uh, Deputy Permanent Representative, US Mission to the United Nations. Uh, on January uh, 12, 2021, he delivered a speech at the UN Security Council open debate on the 20th anniversary of Resolution 1373. I quote here, and that, um, uh, that needs your attention, that as colleagues have mentioned, history has also shown us over and over again that measures to prevent and counter terrorism that come at the expense of human rights and the rule of law are counterproductive. That is why the United States will continue to object to certain countries' action to engage in mass detention of religious minorities and members of other minorities, engage in repressive surveillance and mass data collection, and to use coercive population control like forced sterilization and abortion. Governments, including governments sadly represented in this council, must not use counterterrorism as a pretext for stifling freedom of religion or belief and other human rights and fundamental freedoms. This excerpt indicates the perception which is being built, being built at the international level. Now coming to this, uh, uh, it's, uh, you know, uh, implications with reference to Kashmir. This law, it, uh, primarily meant to protect integrity of India, safeguarding sovereignty of India. But I don't understand how India claims Kashmir to be its territory in the first place, when India is a signatory of many United Nations resolutions, which uh, consider Kashmir a dispute, an internationally recognized dispute. And uh, not only in the United Nations resolutions, India is a signatory. In Simla Accord, signed between the two countries, also talks about the settlement of Kashmir, quote unquote, the words are used here, settlement of Kashmir, right? So even if we claim, for the sake of argument, that Kashmir is, Kashmir is or Kashmir did accession to India, but India itself says it's strictly provisional, strictly provisional, quote unquote. And Nehru said it, it, it's, an, it's an international problem. And uh, no side can, can uh, you know, it could be, uh, uh, the status could be changed or it could be solved unilaterally. 
So these are the words of Indian uh, leadership, Indian government, India. So uh, with this uh, background, uh, how can India claim uh, this uh, JNK uh, to be its territory and talks about the uh, disintegration or cessation of territory? So I, I also quote here B.K. Krishna Menon, who told the Security Council on February 8, 1957, the accession of Kashmir, it's true, can be terminated by our sovereign will. It's possible for any sovereign state to cede territory. If as a result of a plebiscite, if it ever did come, the people decided that they didn't want to stay with India, then our duty at that time would be to adopt those constitutional procedures which would enable us to separate that territory. You know? Similarly, you can also uh, uh, you know, see continuation of the same speech uh, Krishna Menon, representative of India in the uh, United Nations. In Security Council, he said, quote, if we are told that we did not permit anyone in Kashmir to say that there should be a plebiscite, I would say there is, there is nothing further from the truth than that. One of the political parties in Kashmir, which was allowed to fight in the election, which was registered as a party, is called the Plebiscit Front. Its leaders are out, they campaign, they even use the mosques for propaganda, and we have not denied them anything. How could we, with 70,000 people a year going there, with journalists in the place, at any time, even if we wanted to, what is more, what would be the re reaction upon the rest of India our country would not stand for that, unquote. So these are very categorical statements by the Indian leadership, which uh, uh, questions, you know, uh, its relevance uh, with the Jammu and Kashmir. And it suggests that uh, this law can be applied, uh, though it has the, the flaws that we have uh, discussed, you know, previously and in this, uh, my previous part of uh, the, the uh, talk, we have discussed extensively, but whatever the application is, that that application could be there to mainland India, but it has no uh, uh, in, uh, relevance with Jammu and Kashmir. So in this con context, what India is doing in Kashmir under UAPA, arresting human rights defenders, students, journalists, lawyers, and common people is illegal, illegitimate from all canons of human rights laws in practice. India wants to project this law as an effort to counter terrorism, but the world should know that it's a misnomer to hoodwink the global institutions and opinions. The cases registered under UAPA clearly suggest that it's meant to stifle dissent, squeeze already limited space to minorities, advance Hindutva narrative and instill terror among the people raising voice against Modi regime. So it should be repealed forthwith because of its arbitrary nature, misuse and non-confirmation with the accepted principles of human rights. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Vesbin Nassif, for your wonderful presentation. Uh, you gave us the insight of how this lies country to the international human rights standards and what should be done in order to counter this. Uh, as we know, this law is as a collective punishment for the uh, for not only the victim but also for his family because whole family suffers because of the long process of uh, detention of the people and the charges laid against them. In you know, part Kashmir, we have seen the women also uh, were the victims of this law, Naseema Banu, a mother of a freedom fighter, she was booked under this law. And, uh, and similarly, a, a woman police officer was also booked under this law uh, because she tried to uh, as obstruct the siege and search party to enter into a house and then she was also sacked from the service. So uh, this is an, uh, uh, Modi government, as you rightly said, 
has used this law uh, in order to anybody can uh, who questions the Modi regime that faces the consequences of the UAPA. And in North Part Kashmir, we have seen that because of the fear of this law, now journalists and social media activists have used now a self list and self censorship because they face uh, then the music when they post anything about uh, the misuse of authority by the Indian forces or the civil authorities in Kashmir or by the politicians there. So with this, I will go now to Professor Amna Mahmood. Um, Professor Amna Mahmood is a, a, a professor at International University, Islamic International University. Uh, she teaches international relations and political science there. Professor Saiba, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, actually, I am not the expert of law, you know, that I am a professor of political science. Um, uh, the legal perspective is very clear and all of my panelists, dear panelists, they uh, presented the case very well. Uh, one thing I, I feel that this law is itself uh, discriminate because, you know, uh, law um, uh, 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 means to provide justice. And when uh, law is made, the element of justice or is kept there. But this law provide only authorities a right to present the case, and uh, the CN is based on the uh, on the evidence provided by the national investigative agencies. Not uh, any evidence from the uh, victim cannot be entertained. It means that. Uh, law is one-sided. It is not considered to be a law. It is just a verdict already given because uh, uh, people who are victim to this law, uh, their case is prepared just for giving them punishment. So it means that this law is not, not subject to the right of fair trial because courts are there to provide fair trial and then uh, right of defense to the, uh, to the person accused. So I think that uh, this should not be called as a law. Uh, secondly, when we talk about uh, uh, this, uh, these illegal laws starting from 1967, then uh, later version, latest version is I think 2019. Uh, these are all intensifying the uh, grip of the government on legal systems a grip of Indian government on the legal system and denying the right of justice by the uh, uh, courts of Indian um, uh, authorities. Uh, they are actually denying the right of justice and they are giving all authority, transferring all authorities to uh, the courts. It means that uh, India is institutionalizing the process of injustice on the masses. And uh, when we are talking about human rights violation and uh, uh, human rights abuses and uh, uh, state terrorism, this is all instituted and this is all done uh, through a systematic design by the Indian government. And they have brought the things to the level uh, as they are. And then uh, uh, we know that they came to um, 370 uh, revocation. Uh, I think that uh, India, uh, the previous Indian governments before Modi were planning to carry on a soft resistance uh, in Kashmir along with, the, uh, with, with a good face towards the international community. That's why uh, they were soft comparative in comparative sense on the masses, on the protesters, and so. But uh, uh, government of BJP exposed everything. They have decided, because since uh, Modi is himself uh, titled as the butcher of Gujarat and uh, all the cases and the human rights violation against him, but were withdrawn, all the uh, restrictions on him on international travel were, were withdrawn by the US and other Western countries. Uh, with his inaugura inauguration in uh, uh, the office of prime minister, that gave him a courage to extend his brutality and uh, um, his ideology of uh, uh, increasing and dominating Hinduism in 
uh, in India that he was encouraged because of that. Secondly, the international politics going on right now that the whole Western world has changed their perception towards uh, uh, Asia Pacific because it was predicted that this would be the century of uh, Asia, Asian century. So they have reduced uh, Indian Ocean into India, Indo-Pacific. Indo-Pacific means that they have minus the whole uh, Asia, like all Asian tigers, Indonesia, Malaysia, Vietnam, and uh, Laos and other countries who are considered to be uh, non-aligned and they don't want to enter into any alliance, the military alliance. And India is leading all Western uh, oriented uh, military alliances in Indo-Pacific against Russia and uh, China. And India is taking advantage of that uh, international development, especially done by the Biden administration and Quad and uh, other agreements signed here. In that perspective, India feels that there would be no resistance against any human rights violation in, in Indian held Kashmir. And there would be no resistance for uh, 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 legal uh, legal persecution of Kashmiris, which were continued for a long, but now they are uh, augmented and brutalized. Uh, so I think that uh, 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 all these measures taken against uh, human rights activists and uh, uh, journalists are actually an effort, and that is a systematic effort to block any voice in favor of uh, Kashmiris, any voice against uh, all illegal actions against uh, Kashmiris. And uh, that is also uh, that is also supported by international uh, channels, international uh, tools, like uh, if you post any, I have many uh, friends in my friend list in on Facebook, uh, their accounts were blocked just to put their uh, uh, put uh, Vani's uh, uh, picture on their uh, on their DPs, and whenever they post some human rights violation, um, carrying some human rights violation pictures or or videos on their account, their their account is blocked. So it means that that is not only a uh, systematic effort by Indian government, but they are having their allies all around. And you, you see that uh, Indian uh, government's efforts for uh, uh, false propaganda was exposed in, uh, in uh, Belgium, Brussels by the European Union itself, but there is no action taken against that. If there, uh, if there are any action taken against them by the international community, they could have debtor, but the international community is not focused on uh, problems of the Muslims and human rights violation all over the world. They are just focused on recreating a new balance uh, in international politics, and they are ignoring everything. And you know that as Indian announced that on 2020, uh, 23, they are going to hold a conference uh, in, uh, in Kashmir and then uh, they would uh, confirm the, that uh, self-asserted fact that uh, India, uh, that Kashmir is a part of India. So, and uh, all the uh, world powers, world states who would join there in, in Srinagar in that conference, they would also accept that, that Kashmir is the part of India. So I think that uh, since we do have a number of uh, legal experts on our panels, um, I would uh, suggest that there should be some comprehensive and combined efforts uh, on the part of our team to launch a legal uh, process to, um, to uh, fight a legal war. Because, uh, you know, uh, legal war is somehow safe uh, to uh, contest in, in UN and other human rights bodies. Um, and for that purpose, we have to do a lot of homework. And that homework is not uh, only conducting seminars and conducting discussion, uh, 
Uh, but that is much more than that. I think that uh, once I was sitting in Kashmir committee and uh, um, uh, Afridi Saab, who is the chair of, uh, who was the chair, I don't know who is the chair now, but uh, uh, Afridi was the chair of uh, that committee. And he was asserting that I went to number of uh, European Union countries and I fought the uh, um, uh, uh, for, for the point of view of Pakistan in in that uh, uh, in different uh, uh, world capitals and they were all in favor of me. I think this is not the right way. People like you are very good uh, lawyer. People like me, like uh, uh, an academic expert on Kashmir and one of the parliamentarian might be but you know, the legal expert and, uh, and academics can uh, present the case of Kashmir in uh, European universities better than the, uh, the to be presented in, in parliaments. Because in parliaments, people are sitting with vested interest and uh, uh, people in uh, all over the world are least bothered about what is happening in other world. Uh, even I was in US and uh, I was asking about, uh, uh, I was teaching a course on uh, Cold War in South Asia. Cold War in Asia was a broader course and different segments we started there. People in, in US were not, were not knowing where is Asia. They were knowing only few countries like Japan, like India, and they wondered that are they in Asia? So um, I got to know that common public in, in US is not knowing about the problems. And we, when they, so we started raising these problems, they were very interested. The whole European and Western uh, population is very sensitive of human rights violation all over the world. So for that purpose, we should work on, uh, on um, uh, uh, future policy makers. I'm sorry, uh, we have a German shepherd in he is responding to my voice that he's very much concerned to whom I am talking in my room and that's why he's uh, he's he tried to join us. <laughs> uh, so uh, when I was there, I, I uh, found that uh, future policy makers are sitting in in universities. And in a year or two or three, they would join. And they are very, they are having a very strong voice uh, on social media. So we should work on them. Uh, we should present legal point of view. We should present a political point of view on uh, human rights violation. One of the student in one of the seminar questioned me that ma'am, if uh, human rights violation would be addressed can we surrender claim on Kashmir? Obviously, we'll not, we will not. Obviously, we do have a claim. Obviously, all those resolution as uh, Vasi sub mentioned, as Rihanna mentioned, as Nasir Kadri sub mentioned, all these resolutions we claim and we do have this uh, point of view. We do, do have this uh, uh, assertion that we, we claim all that. Uh, that is committed by the international community through UN resolutions. But uh, uh, maybe it may be my opinion, you may disagree, but having interaction with a lot of uh, international diplomats, our own diplomats and uh, our uh, diplomat colleagues uh, from many countries. I met diplomats from at least 20, 25 countries. And they are uh, not ready to listen about Kashmir. When you start about uh, talking, when you start uh, talking on Kashmir, they they pose that oh yeah, I am listening. Yeah, I've heard about that. Yes, you are right. But they are not giving heed to our point of view because they think that we are. Uh, speaking stereotype for the last 70 years and there is nothing in new and uh, you know uh, there, there are two uh, ways to reject uh, uh, one thing one uh, to reduce the importance of one thing that it dies out automatically 
one is to counter it through the full zeal and the other is to leave it aside and then uh, it would be obs obsolete it would be time barred and kashmir is going to be time barred for uh, for the world if we will continue to speak on the same assertion as we started in 1947 and onwards so i think that we should uh, adopt a better a uh, more specific uh, uh, perspective on uh, human rights violation through legal ways because legal argument cannot be countered very easily so i think that that would be the solution when we sit when we uh, sit together then we should uh, take all these rather i would encourage because the, you are the uh, legal experts so we make a, a write a common paper and then it should be published uh, online and uh, we should have we should create as vanisa must have a website and we should uh, uh, write even just a paragraph focused on one particular case that is existed uh, uh, that happened in kashmir and give the legal clause that how this is illegal under the indian constitution under the kashmir uh, laws and under the uh, human uh, uh, un uh, uh, charter then we would be able to make it a case and then it should be posted on our uh, social media website uh, in our account as public then we can uh, it's though apparently it looks that it is a cumbersome and some and long uh, long process but it is not you know the things on website and things on media gets viral within seconds within minutes so if we start writing uh, the, uh, the most lacking thing in in uh, our uh, struggle for kashmir is that we have not produced uh, research papers we have not produced the uh, books on kashmir very few books are written by uh, pakistani uh, perspective pakistani scholars and uh, getting pakistani perspective Though, you know, the first ambassador in of United States in Pakistan, Mr. Talbot, when he back, when he went back to US, he did his PhD in Kashmir and that book is published later on. But we need our own perspective, our, that, that perspective may be carrying the pain we feel for Kashmir, that uh, may be carrying the correct perspective and aspect of Kashmiri human rights violation and their sufferings and uh, uh, that should be in a series we should plan a series of article addressing one two three four five human rights violation clauses dealing with that international precedent uh, to support that and then uh our own perspective on that and then a field survey by the kashmiris done by the kashmiri people living there kashmiri people living uh, in indian uh, in pakistani kashmir and then it should be uh, published in some of the uh, international journal and some of the international media then people would listen that because they think that pakistani media and pakistani uh, scholar pakistani politicians are just having a mantra uh, ye, ye hamara jo systematic effort hame jo academic field mein karne chahi. secondly you know that pakistani government is just following the uh, policy of reaction 370 aya it's all both seminar way may nsd ki member thi i was uh, um, uh, uh, in middle eastern group and uh, 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 advisor on us policy group so eight years all bohot bate hui tv walon ne bhi bohot bulaya iske upar baat ki then it became monotonous bilkul ek aam ban gaya and after that you know there is no uh, discussion about uh, um, Kashmir about 370 and there is no remedy prime minister said that I'm going to present that but there, there was no follow-up he presented very well 
uh, but there was no follow up. Even my friends, I was uh, addressing uh, as keynote in an international conference in Jakarta. My uh, Indonesian colleagues, professors were asking that, what is your uh, take on Kashmir now? means the Pakistani take on Kashmir, but you uh, you haven't listened anything from um, your own foreign office so, for so many days. So I think that uh, this policy of uh, reaction cannot work. There should be a systematic and uh, continuous policy. And I have uh, not seen, uh, you know, the, you are having a basic problem that is your lifeline. You say that Kashmir Sharag hai or iski vajase, the whole Pakistani economy and the whole Pakistani uh, government and the whole Pakistani political system is hostage to uh, uh, military that we are a security state. So whole budget would go there and all the development of other institution is, uh, is halted because of that overdeveloped military uh, because Kashmir is a threat and India but what uh, what they could do it means that uh, there, there is no military solution to kashmir military is for minimum deterrence all others other uh, uh, fight all other uh, fields uh, would be covered by activists legal experts and scholars because politicians and military has been failed to address the uh, Kashmir issue effectively. So, then we need to strategy. And my belief is that we have to write the West way that we write everything. So, we have to write it. We have to write it. We have to record it. And we have to record it for always. So, we have to write a small monograph of 20 or 15 years. And we have to write it. And we are the scholars. We have to write it with us. Collaborate करने. because in in uh, uh, legal uh, profession I have seen just a few uh, professors on uh, experts on Kashmir. So uh, if you can collaborate with us, I am ready to do that. Vani Saab ke saath magish haksar baat hoti hai aur inke saath bahut achhi interaction hai. तो मैं ना जब मैं बात करती हूँ तो I'm sorry अगर मैं कोई गुस्ताखी कर रही हूँ या मैं अपने बोस्टिंग कर रही हूँ लेकिन मैं ये चाहती हूँ कि हम सिर्फ बातें ना करें मैं चाहती हूँ कि हम ना जो हमारे बस में है वो हम कंक्रीट एक्शन लें ना तो हम लिखें इसके ऊपर देखें हमने कितनी किताबें कश्मीर पे लिखी कितने आर्टिकल आप आप देखें कि हमने लिखे हमने मतलब मैंने और आपने ना आपके ऊपर भी तो जिम्मेदारी है ना आप भी तो कोर्ट का मुकदमा लड़ने के लिए छह बीस बीस सफे की पचास पचास सफे के केसेस बनाते हैं उसके साथ एविडेंस अटैच करते हैं तो आपने कश्मीर के लिए कितना कुछ लिखा और उसके साथ कितने एविडेंसेस अटैच किए और दैट्स व्हाई वी कुड नॉट गेट अ रेजोल्यूशन पास्ड ऑन ह्यूमन राइट्स इन एनी ऑफ द अभी ये जो एक यू की एक ही रेजोल्यूशन अभी तक आई है जो कश्मीर के हक में थी तो आई वुड सजेस्ट दैट वी वर्क एज अ टीम वी शुड कॉन्ट्रीब्यूट इन existing uh, struggle of Kashmiris by uh, putting our weight as a legal expert, putting our weight as a scholar. And then that would be totally uh, uh, apolitical. So when it would be apolitical, people would listen us because these people are not politicians. They are not raising slogans. They are not giving only utopian picture. They are not only doing their uh, point scoring. They are the people seriously working for Kashmir. So a lot of people in the uh, West, I saw the biggest habit in the West, and people talk about it there, that there are also the housewives who read the news. वहां पे देखें हर कौम की डेवलपमेंट की कोई रीजन होती है ना हमने अपनी औरतों को समझा कि ये तो अगर लड़की पढ़ी होती है तो हम कहते हैं कि ये फालतू क्यों बैठी है टाइम जाया करिए जाके उतनी देर में हांडी पका ले तो हम अपनी पढ़ी लिखी बच्चियों को भी वहीं पे रखते हैं जबकि ज्यादा जिम्मेदारी जो है वो अः माँ की होती है कि उसको पता हो मसला क्या तो हम अगर छोटे छोटे सी बातें ऐसे सेंसिटाइज करके लिखेंगे और उसको कोई हाउस वाइफ पढ़ेगी तो वो शायद अपने बच्चों को भी बताएगी वो बात आगे भी जाएगी 
और छोटे छोटे जो बच्चे मीडिया पे बैठे होते हैं दे आर यू नो वेरी इंथ्यूजियस्ट एंड वेरी एक्टिव तो अगर हमारे पास बहुत बजट है ये हमारे जो दो भाई, भाई हैं जो अपारा वाले ये भी बड़ी एक्टिव मोमेंट चलाते हैं चला रहे हैं बट दे डोंट हैव दैट एक्सपर्टी टू रन दैट मोमेंट इनके पास वो नहीं है एक्सपर्टी ना ये अपनों को भी वैसे ही डील करते हैं जैसे बाहर वालों को करते हैं और क्योंकि मैं तो वहां पढ़ाने भी जाती हूँ तो मैंने देखा कि इनका जो 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 इनको डायरेक्शन दे दें ये करते रहते हैं और बड़े अच्छे तरीके से करते हैं लेकिन सोचने समझने की सलाहियत जो है ना वो ऑब्वियसली आपकी और हमारी जिम्मेदारी है तो हम अगर अपनी कौम को डायरेक्शन नहीं देंगे चले हमसे कोई नहीं पूछता तो हम खुद ही लिख के बता दें बता तो सकते हैं ना वन हिसाब से तो शायद पूछ लेते हैं लोग मेरे से तो कोई नहीं पूछता मुझे तो कहते हैं प्रोफेसरों को क्या पता है चुप करके बैठे तो मैं ये चाहती हूँ कि हम सब मिल के लिखे एंड वी बिल्ड अप अ केस एंड एक दो तीन चार अगर सीरियस में छ अच्छे आर्टिकल एक साल में कश्मीर पे आ जाएंगे रिसर्च पेपर्स तो कोई ना कोई एक्सपर्ट इन साउथ एशियन स्टडी सेंटर इन इन एशियन स्टडी सेंटर कहीं यूके में बैठा हुआ कहीं यूएस में बैठा हुआ कहीं बेल्जियम बेल्जियम में बैठा हुआ उसको देखेगा फिर वो उस पर बात करेगा और उसको कोट करेगा और जितनी साइटेशन होंगी उतने लोगों तक आपका पैगाम पहुंचेगा ठीक है तो मेरा ख्याल है कि हम बहुत अच्छा करते हैं सेमिनार आई वुड अप्रिशिएट वानी साहब ये भाई हैं और इनके साथ एक ताल्लुक है लेकिन इसके साथ मैं इनको अप्रिशिएट करती हूँ कि ये सेमिनार कराते हैं और मुझे भी पता चला कि रिहाना भी इस पे काम कर रही है नासिर कादरी भी इस पे काम कर रहे हैं वासी साहब भी इस पे काम कर रहे हैं तो ये भी मेरे साथ मिल काम कर सकते हैं सो वी कैन स्टार्ट विद हम एक मोनोग्राफ से शुरू कर सकते हैं जिसको हम खुद ही छाप लेंगे और खुद ही वेबसाइट पे अपने ही डाल देंगे वेबसाइट पे उसको भी बहुत लोग पढ़ लेंगे और खुद ही छपवा भी देंगे या एक एक दो दो सफे के पेपर अगर हम किसी अखबार में लिख लेंगे तो दैट वुड बी बेटर सर्विस टू हाईलाइट द ह्यूमन राइट्स अब्यूज और बेशक हमारा वो क्लेम खत्म नहीं हुआ कि हम हमें जो है वो कश्मीर चाहिए हमें प्लेबिसिट करवाना है वहाँ के लोगों को राइट टू सेल्फ डिटर्मिनेशन मिलना चाहिए लेकिन अगर आप स्टेप बाय स्टेप शुरू करेंगे ना पहले आप ह्यूमन राइट्स पे वायलेशन पे बात करें फिर दुनिया आपसे पूछेगी कि हाँ हाँ क्यों हो रही है ये तो फिर आप बताएं कि ये इसलिए हो रही है राइट टू सेल्फ डिटर्मिनेशन नहीं दिया गया दैट इज ऑल फ्रॉम माय साइड थैंक यू वेरी मच थैंक यू प्रोफेसर साहब फॉर योर अवेलेबल इनपुट एंड योर ऑफर टू कोलाबोरेट विद अदर speakers and academy and learning persons to write on kashmir to make create more and more awareness at international level uh and said that i will uh, rather make an uh apology we are uh, at least uh, what we are doing in our uh limited resources nasir qadri and me and i like others uh, we try to uh, do this at different levels like nasir qadri is uh, he, he made a very valiant effort in uk uh, and uh, and uh, fir was launched against perpetrators in india against indian uh, army chief and home minister on some of the counts of uh, violations they, they are doing in kashmir it was in first ep- effort on the rbf but at the end of the day it is the government of uh, the uk who has to ask the prosecutor to proceed further then it comes to the politics again their international relations again in that likewise uh, what we are doing in order to make all these things happen we do report each and every incident to the un special rapporteur un human rights council and all that and you might be knowing that uh, from last uh, from 5th of august till date and at least three of the uh, special communications are especially on this uapa from the un special rapporteurs so uh, we are trying our bit and we need your help we need the help of dr wasir yahana and others in order to make it more comprehensive uh, so that we we are looking forward for your support in this regard and inshallah with wasir saab and you and tarzi saab we will devise a policy how we can move ahead with this joint venture in order to create more awareness at the international level about kashmir 
thank you very much all panelists if there is any question from any side if anybody has to say anything um, more there is one thing and rihana wants to say something yes um yeah. i i was uh, listening to all of you and then a few things came in, into my mind i'm not going to take a lot of time but i would like to add on first of all i would like to thank uh, professor amna mahmood saiba uh, i really really loved her ad advices and she was really good with the point she was saying and personally i was thinking to uh, visit our local universities so i can go and actually uh, pass my knowledge on to them and i can actually get them on on board because i do arrange a protest in london so in that way they can come to the protest and they can understand the history and they can see the violations uh, which is taking place now going to write in articles now i i've already started writing articles myself because i am going on to the different like uh, conferences programs so, so the best thing is as you said earlier that pakistani and kashmiris we don't have many people who are writing uh, the correct narrative of kashmir and india is actually misguided not only the world is misguiding indians as well so it's very important uh, that we actually write something um the other thing i would like to say is about yasin malik now yasin malik he is uh, having uh, one more um, hearing coming on on the 15th of july so let's pray that everything goes well uh, and this hearing is going to be quite serious now the, the laws which have been actually imposed on yasin malik like unlawful activities provision act and then uh, the other uh, like public safety act and we know quota as well now these laws as, as i had explained earlier and i'm going to say this once again they are invalid why they are invalid because since the 44 amendment act 1978 was passed so any laws before that the, uh, detention laws they were invalid and as i said earlier the indian constitution article 22 subsection 4 and subsection 7 were removed now because they were removed so any detention laws are actually can't be actually legal uh, le legal to actually be slammed on actually people and any procedures relating to it so we need to highlight and and we all know the abdul guru shaheed and then a uh, maqbool bad shaheed they were actually um uh, like murdered uh, like they are shaheed for us but they were they were actually murdered by them and till today we, we don't have the remains the uh, kashmiris or the families now these were all under these car type of laws as well which were illegal and invalid so under uh, uh, under the geneva convention article 17 paragraph 3 that what they have done by not giving the remains is a huge huge uh, like violation of 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 like uh, um, uh, like human rights and we need to actually make sure that we let the world know that they have violated article 17 paragraph 3 so what i'm trying to say is that like before they do this thing again we need to let the world know that geneva conventions are actually been violated especially article 27 where it says that each kashmiri because it's a, a a protected person so they so they way of life the customs the the religion the the their family life cannot be interfered can can actually not be violated under any kind of circumstances so we need to make sure that the world knows this that what is happening in in kashmir is actually violating uh, not only war crimes it's actually violating the human rights and it's a, it's a it's a uh, like uh, um uh, uh, i actually forgot that um it's actually a burden uh, it's, it's 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 actually um below the uh, in international standard now go, going on to that i would like to say that upa is not only invalid but illegal at below the international uh, standards of human, human rights by united nation and amnesty international upa is a uh, disrespecting uh, also the uh, the declaration of human right article 1 where it says all humans are born free and equal in dignity so we need to tell the world that how can you say that one part like the west people living in the west are free and people who are living in the east are not free like this that doesn't make sense we need to actually tell them to talk about equality where does the equality go why does the world not unite when it comes to ukraine the world is united when it comes to kashmir when it comes to palestine they, they don't want to know they, they just think it's a matter which is dragging on and one day it will die no we need to tell them when you talk about ukraine you need to make sure that you talk about kashmir you you should talk about palestine and moving on uh, to one of the things you were talking uh, one uh, i think it was avas bin uh, wasi sahib he was talking about the uh, the instrument of um, assassination with kashmir now i would like to add on under clause 5 when the maharaja signed the in, in, instrument of uh, um, assassination he made it very clear that if any kind of if any kind of change will be done 
it will make that clause like it will make that instrument of a session invalid so when india took on its, its first article uh, first um, constitution 1950 that agreement and any laws before it became invalid so basically that contract was invalid anyway and then india went on to do 370 and 35 so what i think is that wasn't even valid because the maharaja said only he has the right to add a instrument of supplement in case any changes are going to be done so he didn't add anything did this was done by the indian government so from day one we all know there was no agreement because the united nations uh, because the uh, the british raj said only the majority of people living there will decide their future like the kashmiri and the majority was muslim and they were not given their right and if it was valid the, there was no reason of india to leave the maharaja and run run to the united nation and one more point till today united nation has never seen that instrument of, uh, of agreement and one more point i will add on that mostly it has been told that the, that the uh, agreement was signed between uh, India and Kashmir on the 26th of October 1947, which is a lie because at that time Maharaja wasn't even in, even in Srinagar at that time. He arrived the next day on the 27th late at night. So it's most probably they signed it either late at night or on the 28th of October. So these are things which we, we, which we need to actually remember. And I would like to add on um, one thing more. Uh, like uh, now, people like me who actually talk about Kashmir, people, people like um, um, uh, Abdul Hamid Lone, people like um, like Michelle Malik, like uh, my friend, uh, the, the, the wife of Yasin Malik, and Naila, Naila Kiani, who actually works in Alaska Kashmir. We have all been charged in, in, in India under the Information Technology Act. 2000 section 69a so if you are not in india they can charge this section on you what happened is that all of our information gets passed on to the home minister and the home minister passes it on to the court now the two how the ag charges either the informers and tell us that this is what we are doing or either without our clients without our not they actually go to the court and to get hearing done and now because of this hearing me and all of these people i just named now we in near India seven years in months with the heavy fine. This is what they are doing to us. And then they pass this informa information on to Twitter. Now our accounts are withheld, not only in India, even in Indian occupied Kashmir. People can't see whatever we are writing on Twitter. And the reason, and I did this research because I heard some people saying account withheld. So I started researching and I found out that this is the law they are using because they find us um, a, a threat to Indian eternity, and that's the reason why they have actually put cases on us, and 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 then we uh, like we are criminals of the state of India. But I'm proud that I am talking for, from for my land, and, and I'm talking for my Kashmiris, and I'm standing by Pakistan, and I'm doing what I have to do as a human, as a Pakistani, and as a Kashmiri. And I would like to thank you all for listening to me, and inshallah, we will pray that Yasin Malik gets freedom and all our Kashmiri leaders get freedom because they've all been charged on the similar cases and I say to you all that we need to unite we, we need to find one company one lawyer who can deal with all of the cases together because they are similar so we can become one voice because uh, like I always say that ideologies can wait not freedom let's unite thank you thank you was this have anything to add yes. You are mute. You are mute, sir. Okay, now I'm audible. Yeah, yeah. Okay, the, thank you so much, uh, Vani sir. Uh, uh, quite comprehensively, discussion has already been made, but some suggestion that I would like to uh, proffer here. The, uh, apart from, uh, uh, you know, uh, supporting the recommendations and suggestions by Prof Professor Amna Mehmood, Two immediate suggestions. One thing is that since uh, uh, a quite uh, uh, rich, insightful discussion took place today, I think that there should be video clips of uh, different video clips of the speakers, which should yeah. be and which should be circulated and which should be sent to the concerned quarters. I think that we should do that. Second uh, yeah. suggestion could be that we can transcribe the whole proceedings of the seminar, whatever the uh, panelists 
they have uh, shared their uh, you know thoughts of the vision suggestions recommendation everything so i think they need to be properly transcribed and after having had the editing of that thing it could be published uh, this is my second suggestion third thing is that the reports for example uh, 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 Sabisa, i also went through that report that is also uh, very comprehensive uh, i think we need to think about that how the digital digital presentation can be made based on that report and if there are some other reports which are prepared by kir we need to transform it into digital form because now uh, if we can transform it in that uh, medium i think it would have more efficacy and more effectiveness than the written discourse i am not undermining importance of written discourse but i think that both needs to be done simultaneously to amplify our discourse thank you so much uh, thank you sir uh, suggestion is well taken uh, about the proceedings of the seminar yes, surely we will uh, have the video clips of these and they will be sent to the uh, uh, disseminated on the social media as well as to the speakers as well and as far as the old proceedings uh, we are transcripting all these proceedings always all the seminars all the webinars which we do we transcript them and we prepare a whole report of this uh, but before that we do issue a press release of this that's a normal routine to issue a press release but the report of the whole transcription is always prepared and that is uh, being and this time we will send it to you for uh, editing and it will have the additional burden on you oh, so you. i would love to do it <laughs> thank you uh, professor amna mahmud saheba ji bas uh, i just wanted to add one point as uh, rehana mentioned that we are going to hire a lawyer to defend uh, yasin malik you know uh, do we believe, we do believe that people's are power and they are uh, having their voice and uh, public demonstrations are having their effect but you know legal war is to be fought in uh, is to be fight uh, is to be there uh, contested in court so uh, uh, yasin malik you know mishal and yasin malik uh, met me once and i have a long sitting with him when he was not married he was telling me about his engagement in uh, and every uh, thing like that उस शख्स से मैं उसको जानती हूँ और वो इतना अच्छा आदमी है कि जाहिर है कि हम सब के दिल के करीब है वो बंदा लेकिन जो उनकी सबसे बड़ी गलती है ये कि उन्होंने लॉयर रखने से इनकार कर दिया सो आई थिंक दिस इज नॉट गुड दिस एटीट्यूड इज नॉट गुड एंड देन दैट मेड इंडियन अथॉरिटीज मोर कॉन्फिडेंट टू पनिश हिम यू नो so i think that uh, we should hire a team of lawyers very competent very concerned very dedicated and uh, we should bail out uh, this uh, uh, yasin malik from all these affair and that may be taken later as a precedent for all our other uh, uh, detainees by indian government so uh, that is my suggestion please uh thank you professor saiba you rightly said that uh, legal battles should be fought in the courts but as we know about the indian courts the way the indian courts have been behaving uh since long with the people of kashmir with the leadership of kashmir actually uh, what yasin has thought and what he has done is that as these are the charges against yasin and the case against yasin and others is a political one so he thought to fight it so politically he uses the same language as was used by nelson mandela if asking for freedom is a crime i have committed it i will continue to commit it so uh, he just uh, gave an answer to the indians in the political language because all these crimes are political uh, charges are politically motivated all these cases are politically motivated they don't have any legal basis or that and on the way of uh, having the uh, team of uh, legal expertise uh, we have come to know about the prime minister azad kashmir president azad kashmir they said we have met some barristers and all that we are uh, considering to permit the legal experts to fight this case but at the, at the end of the day it depends upon uh then in the in the courts of india it depends upon the government of india whether they will allow anybody to do it or 
uh, whether the court has uh, given Yasin this much of jurisdiction to do this. So these are long and lengthy questions to be answered uh, by the legal fraternity. When, when we come to the Indian occupied, I always say when people talk on legal grounds, we do talk. We do make a case on legal grounds and all these, we talk of the local laws, we talk of international laws, we talk of international human rights laws. We use all this vocabulary in our literature, in all these things. But at the end of the day, decision making is made on politics. It is made on power. might is right. So the Indians, whatever they are doing, they are so arrogant. They don't take into consideration neither the reports of special reporters nor the report of the human rights commissioner, the two reports of them, and they, they are trying their best to block the third one, uh, which is offering, in, uh, we hope that in September we will have the third report on Kashmir. So uh, India has uh, a big cloud as, as they are trying to uh, block us everywhere, but we have to knock each and every door so that one day the conscience of the world awakeness and people start listening to us and uh, the sand voices will prevail and India will be made accountable of its crimes against humanity and against the people in New York but Kashmir. Thank you very much all. Nasir Qadri Saab is there. I don't think he is there. He has just put us there, he is there. So thank you very much all. With this, I beg leave from all of you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.